and I go back to the old uh, 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 cliche that you can make money in any market if you know that market. So that that's really it. Just just know it, understand it, and we could talk for hours on what the tools are to to get that information. But you know, I think we all we all know what those are. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Listen, if you're enjoying the show and getting good value, do me a favor, help you, help us. Uh, leave us a rating and review. Give us some honest feedback on the show so we can make this show work harder for your investing goals. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, we've got a great show today. We're going to be talking to Ashland Capitals, Alex Kogan, and Greg Bronson. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if you want to grow as a multifamily investor, you have to spend more time with other multifamily investors. And an easy way to do that is to join our apartment investing mastermind group today. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the mastermind button. Now, as a part of this group, you'll get access to expert trainings, group coaching calls, industry news and updates, as well as all of our webinars and workshops, including our three-hour workshop on raising capital. Again, if you want to be around other multifamily investors that can help you scale your portfolio today and grow your network, make sure you're a part of the Apartment Investing Mastermind. Just go to kasmancapital.com and click on the Mastermind button today. Alex, Greg, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm going to give you guys a chance to kind of go over your bios individually. Why don't you take a minute or two each and just give us a little bit more background on where you're at. Alex, why don't you start? Hey, John. Thanks. Thanks for having us on this morning. Um, so a quick background on myself. I've been in real estate construction and development for almost 25 years now. Started out in single family development, had a construction company, design build firm. Um, my, my family was in the real estate business, but I ventured out west, uh, founded a firm in 98 in Colorado. I uh, grew that over 20 years. Um did uh, a bunch of development, a bunch of acquisitions, a lot of building, of course, with the primary company. And uh, after 20 years, decided that I wanted to sell the business and I wanted to scale up into uh, larger acquisitions. So in 2018, roughly, I started selling off my entire portfolio, uh, ended up selling the construction company in 2019. Uh, and uh, yeah, about 2017, 18, started buying larger um, uh, multifamily assets and student housing. And that's really been the transition over 25 years. So for the last five years, we've been focused on multifamily student housing uh, and, uh, and yeah, and growing from there. I love it. Greg, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Um so I've been in I've been in real estate investments for over 18 years now, both on the equity and debt side, primarily focused on you know residential real estate, commercial scale residential real estate, um, student multifamily, and some senior housing. All of it, you know, with a large scale residential bend. Um, you know, I've scaled platforms and, and built up, you know, larger portfolios over time, closing over uh, $2 billion of transactions over the course of my career. Um, and, you know, have joined Ashland to run acquisitions and investments uh, across the multifamily and student housing space. And, um, you know, now is a, a very interesting time in the market to be, uh, to be focusing there. Yeah, man. So to plan that back, Alex, you come from kind of the development world. You know, you mentioned you're out west doing some developments and had your own portfolio of assets, sold those to scale into larger commercial real estate. And Greg, you come from, you know, a background of 18 years in real estate plan, both the equity and the debt side. You talked about being in residential, but really commercial scale residential. So I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Alex, I want to start with you, right? First question for me is, you know, you came from development, making money, you know, being a developer and having your own portfolio. Why did you decide to sell those assets off to scale into larger commercial real estate? Yeah, it was, um, candidly, it started out as a sideline. Um, I mean, not, not as much of a hobby, but, you know, personal portfolio of acquiring and developing some assets with my own capital. Over time, what happened was 
that uh, I, I sort of expected my my CFO and my my construction company platform to manage all that, and we did, and, and they did. Over time, it just became too big of an effort. Uh, I also realized that um, <clears throat> owning many small <clears throat> excuse me owning many small assets was actually challenging. Uh, along the way, I realized that I could actually scale the business by owning uh, larger assets, but but less of them. Uh, and I could also uh, expand across the country to markets that I that I liked, had faith in, and had um, uh, good relationships with third party managers. So that was really the evolution. I, I saw a path that I wasn't, you know, having to just buy in my backyard and having to manage uh, a large portfolio of small assets. I think that's interesting because so many people, when you think of scaling, they think of just doing more of what they're already doing, right? And if you're buying duplexes, that's great. Maybe you've got five duplexes, you've got 10 units. Uh, and to scale that, you know, it could be a challenge because you're like, all right, there's a financing component, then there's the actual management component. And it sounds like you kind of looked at that and said, you know what, this is actually difficult. Why don't I step back, sell some of these assets and actually go get kind of that larger commercial real estate? It's almost like the game Monopoly, right? You got these, these green houses, trade those in for the hotel, you're generating more cash you know, and you're able to, you know, have some more efficiencies there. So it's really, uh, I, I think it's a great way of thinking about the business. I think sometimes people don't realize what it means to scale and what that pathway is to scale. Uh, so it's great to hear you talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah I think the, last, yeah, the last thing I'll add was that, you know, I knew that I was going to move, leave Colorado, move back to Chicago where I'm from. And I wanted to be less tied to Colorado. I didn't want to have all my assets in just Colorado. I wanted to have some in the Midwest, uh, Southeast. So that was another motivating factor. Location freedom. Because again, if you had everything in Colorado, you probably feel more connected or tied or almost, you know, bolted to that market as opposed to having the flexibility to invest in other markets as well. Uh, Greg, you, as we were talking about scaling, you know, you mentioned that you were doing residential, but you were doing commercial scale residential. Can you dive into that just a little bit more? Sure. So, you know, when people say residential, they often think, you know, single family homes. Um, when, when I say commercial scale residential, I mean multifamily student housing, you know, larger, larger scale uh properties, you know, 100 plus units um, is really where I was focused. So, you know, I, I had built um, a few platforms, you know, one student housing platform that was over 9,000 beds, um, another in a, in a following life that had scaled up to um, almost 4,000 beds. Um, and, and, prior to that had worked, you know, at a family office that was um, a mixed, a mixed portfolio of properties across student self storage, multifamily retail. So, you know, a, a full mix of property types, um, but, you know, still multi and, and students. So, you know, they were larger scale residential properties, commercial scale properties, but residential oriented. Got it. Residential in a sense that people are living there, not necessarily a single family house. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. The the they were residences for multiple people. You know, I I always caveat the way that I position it because some people view multifamily as residential, some people view it as commercial. So I, I always position it both ways because people put it in two different buckets. So um, I'm always very careful to say commercial scale or residential. Yeah. So on the flip you know, side, I wanted to have, you're, you're seeing a lot of headlines about, you know, commercial real estate tanking. And I think people just look at that generically. They don't know. What does that mean? Does that mean multifamily? Does that mean office, industrial, et cetera? And then obviously, most of the headlines are referring to office as in commercial. So I think that's a good distinction. What part of commercial real estate is doing well, is not doing so well, uh, is thriving, et cetera. Yeah, Alex, to that point, I mean, you've kind of expanded. You've got some student housing. You have some more, I don't want to say traditional, but multifamily investments. I know you look at other asset classes as well. 
How do you make that distinction or what, what are you looking at when you make a decision to say, hey, you know what, we should be investing more in student housing versus multifamily? Talk to us a little bit more about your approach. Well, you know, for me, it was, um, I wish I could say it was strategic and calculated, but, you know, when I first started, I started buying uh, single family homes. I started buying duplexes, triplexes. And then ultimately I was in a location where there was a small college. So I started renting to college students and that's where I really got my exposure. I liked rent, renting to college students. Uh, so as I kind of moved through my career and started buying more and more, I saw the opportunity for purpose-built student housing. And I guess I wasn't as intimidated as some people might be uh, and and just got into it. You know, and you, you buy one, it's going well, you say, okay, I want more of this, right? And uh, and then, then you really start studying it, you understand, the data, the the drivers behind it, the growth of purpose-built student housing. Uh, and then you go through, of course, uh, COVID. And then you say, oh my God, what's going to happen to student housing? For example, what's going to happen to multifamily? And I think it's really, you, you, you stay aware of what's going on in the industry. You keep up with it. You're following trends. And that's how, that's what informs our decisions. You know, um, you know I could talk a lot about how I think every every year there's something that happens, whether it's economic or something with, you know, with 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 a specific demographic, uh, COVID that happens that informs us that says, okay, keep going down the path that you were going, or why don't you shift a little bit, go, you know, veer to the left or to the right. Um, so that's really, I mean, you know, how we how we make our decisions. Um, so student housing, obviously, and conventional has been good to us, but we always have our, our eyes wide open that says, hey, are there going to be headwinds? Should we be, you know, shifting more of the portfolio in one direction or the other? No, I think it's a great point. And with that noted, I mean, Greg, you're kind of leading up acquisitions. So how does that impact your viewpoint, your criteria and kind of, you know, your buy box as you're going out there looking for assets? Yeah, I mean. Continuing, continuing to to look at all market trends and and be eyes wide open with you know how the world is continuing to change because we we are in a very tumultuous market environment to to put it not mildly, I mean that that is that is the reality of the world that we're in, and with that you know it does present more opportunities you know, although challenges. Um, I would say in a market like this, there are cases to be made for the, the recession resiliency of student housing. Um, but at the same time, multifamily over the long term, you know, has been historically, you know, a very steady performer. So I wouldn't say that one versus the other is the the be all end all. I would say that both in a well-balanced portfolio are are great investments. Now our investment thesis is more value add oriented than than um core or core plus oriented. So you know we we are not we are not trying to you know, quite honestly, hold these over a 10 to 20 year hold period. So we are looking for opportunistic investments where we can generate outsized returns through, you know, through a value add investment by at a, an attractive basis where there is a motivated seller in an off market situation. Okay. So, you know, that doesn't always mean that you know, that we're quite honestly, a hundred percent focused on every single market trend necessarily. There may be, there may be a specific nuance in a transaction where we can find something that has a unique idiosyncratic story where, you know, we can buy an asset that has a unique single investment thesis and generate an outsized return. But on the whole, our investment thesis behind student and multi is there on an absolute basis. 
Yeah, if I'm playing by what you said, it's first of all, you know, um, the thing that when you talk about multifamily student housing, I think most people would say that those are two recession resilient asset classes, right? And to your point, student housing may be a little bit more than multifamily, but both historically have fared pretty well uh, during different recessions. Your investing thesis is more value add oriented. So not looking for core plus, which essentially is something that's fairly new where, you know, it's stabilized, but the plan is just to hold it over a longer period of time because it'll go up in value over that time. You're looking for opportunities where you can come in, find a play, you know, add some value and get outsized returns, which is what I think a lot of listeners are looking for. Um, and I like the fact that you said there might be kind of a little nugget or nuance within that deal. Maybe there's something that other folks miss or something that's in the market trend that allows you to capture that upside that maybe other people miss. Um, talk to me a little bit more about that, you know, particularly like, you know, where are you sourcing information today? Because there, there's just a ton of stuff going on, right? So when you're looking at market data, or you're looking at information, or you're looking at, you know, all of these different things, where are some resources that you really focus and trust uh, as you're looking at deals and opportunities today? Well, out, outside of just data, I would say, you know, the biggest thing is off-market relationships. And even though, even though, you know, we're viewing everything that's on market, we're underwriting everything that's on market and staying in front of all of those opportunities that don't trade and continuing to follow up on them. So, you know, very often things are being marketed, you know, at a price X, right? And they don't sell because brokers say, Brokers say, you know, to to a seller, you know, you can get X, and um, you know, X was yesterday's pricing when interest rates, you know, when the the ten year was at three and a half, and you know now it's at at four and a half or you know whatever whatever it is exactly today, um, and you know pricing has come down another 10, 15 percent. And so, you know, pricing has moved considerably. So it's not actually at X, it's at 10, 15% below that. And so we will actually submit offers and stay in front of those, those brokers and those sellers and say, we're here, is there an update? Is there an update? Um, even when they say no, um, and we'll continue to follow up because every once in a while, you know, there is capitulation that is happening in the market. And, you know, the 30% spread, you know, bid ask spread that was there, you know, six, 12 months ago has started to, has started to move. And it is now closer to, you know, five to 10%. Um, and so staying in front of those opportunities is, is, slowly seemingly starting to to chip away that's not to say that things are really moving but you know it, at least they're starting to be some more reasonableness in market pricing greg you, you just gave a very valuable insight and I, i'm not sure if everyone caught it so i want to just play that back you know you started by talking about you know looking for off-market opportunities and building off-market relationships but you actually talked about focusing on deals that are on market first right underwriting those deals and recognizing that, hey, our offer is probably not there. But instead of just putting in that one LOI and walking away and, okay, it didn't work, you're staying, on, you're staying in front of these brokers, you're staying in front of these relationships, and you're checking in. And as the numbers move, as the numbers shift, you're continuing to check in, and that may change. And it's a really great insight because if, if anyone's struggling to find deals, they should really think about that strategy because you know, it is the way you get deals, right? You got to build these relationships. And one of the deals we did uh, a couple of years ago, that's exactly what happened. It was a deal that I saw, you know, before, underwrote it before. The seller had a specific number in mind. It didn't make sense the first time we saw it. And it didn't make sense to anybody else in the market, right? It actually got under contract two or three times, fell out of contract all those times. And then about maybe a year later, that owner was still on the same price, but because interest rates were dropping at that point, and when we looked at the cost of capital and where the market rates was going, because rents were going up, 
when I underwrote that deal a year later, it actually did make sense at their number. So staying in front of those those brokers, and by the way, the deal was still off market at that point because the owner was, you know, shell shocked and was like, well, I don't want to list it again and I don't want to have another group of people come through it. So now it was a pocket listing. So to your point, being able to build these relationships and continue to check in, well, now you're not competing with everyone else who sees that it's on market and submitting their LOIs. Once that process kind of finishes, well, now they've gotten a dose of reality with where the market is and you can kind of negotiate almost one-on-one -on -one off market. So really great insight you just provided. I just wanted to make sure the listeners kind of caught that because I thought it was a really powerful nugget. And, and one thing I'll add to that, uh, that we're also uh, conscious of is a, a motivated seller. You know, I think, you know, we want to, when we are going after deals, I mean, this, this ties back to, um, you know, the point that you made, John, that at some point people uh, may not be market sellers. They're not ready to take their medicine, so to speak, and, and sell at where, where the market is. So, you know, on the one hand, we're focused on guys, uh, people who are market sellers and not just aspirational sellers that want to test the market and see where the market is today. And there's a lot of those. There's a lot of aspirational sellers that, you know, they don't have to sell. They've got long-term debt. They may want to sell. They may want to put their money elsewhere. They, want to, they may want to retire, but they're just not market sellers. Um, so I think the more that we focus on and guys that have motivation to sell, you know, the obvious, uh, you know, factors that might be a partnership um, issues and tensions and people want to part ways. It might be, of course, uh, loan maturity. It, it might be, you know, floating rate debt. There's some sort of financial or other pressure that says, hey, we, we're motivated. We want to move on. So if we can sift through deal flow and try to understand those motivations and try to dig a little bit through the broker or, or seller direct, uh, you know, I think we'll be more uh, effective with our time. But to your point, John, if, if we learn that they're aspirational and not uh, market sellers, that goes on another list to follow up and follow that deal uh, to find out, did it trade? Did it not trade? Um, and, and let's see, you know, when, when that becomes a, a deal that's worth pursuing or not. I love that. You gave three examples and I actually wanted to go a little bit deeper there to understand how do we determine a motivated seller? You said three things that uh, you mentioned. One, uh, do they have a partnership that's either dissolving or not working well? Is the loan maturing? And then a third is, do they have floating rate debt that maybe they need to get out of? Um, are you just asking these questions directly to the broker or what are you doing to kind of uncover it? Because obviously we know there's a cat and mouse game when it comes to leverage and negotiations. And sometimes you're told one thing and that doesn't necessarily seem to be the, the case. So how are you actually uncovering that true motivation to decide if this person is a motivated seller? Yeah, good, good question. I mean, you know, we have data, we can look up to see what their loan is. So we can find out what type of, um, you know, loan that they have in place. So we'll, we'll look that up, we'll see when it matures, what, you know, what type of debt, how much debt we can sort of back into, you know, where we think they are financially. Um, but, but there's no better way than to just ask the question, you know, you'd have to have a, you know, somebody who's, who's being fairly intentionally deceptive to to paint a whole nother story which there's there's plenty of but there's just a number of ways when you where you can kind of triangulate and understand what's going on if there's a broker you ask the broker if there's a seller you ask to see if, if, if you can do a call with the seller and 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 sort of get a feel for the property i mean it, it allows you to get some FaceTime or phone time with the seller and then, you know, when they're unprepared, you ask certain questions that hopefully will reveal the real story. Then there's property management. If it's third party, you know, what I've learned in, in this business is, you know, especially with on-site staff, if you ask the question, they have no filter, they will tell you. So it, it gets down to an art of how you ask the question, what questions you, you ask. Um, I mean, we've literally have gone to the point of when we're doing, you know, diligence on a property, I've got somebody from my team that's walking with the on-site PM while I might be walking with the, with the facilities, uh, you know, supervisor and you separate the two. So there's not this, you know, uh, coordinated effort with the story and you ask two different people the same question, you're going to get two different answers that, that 
informs you to dig here or dig there. So it's, you know, you at the end of the day, you get a feel. You get a feel if somebody is BSing you and you get a feel if there's an opportunity. And it it takes, you know, it takes that kind of, you know, face to face to figure out what what the motivation is, what the opportunity is. No, I love that. You gave some really nice kind of tactical things there. I love that point about, you know, if you've got a team, you're doing due diligence for Tony Asset, you know, divide and conquer, you know, have a couple people walk with different folks, whether that's the broker or the, the facilities manager, the onsite PM, the leasing agent, you know, but if you can have your team kind of split up and talk to the people asking the same question different ways and just kind of comparing notes on the back end, you'll get a really good feel for what's going on. Uh, I remember I was touring a property last year and like, no, you're very spot on, right? Like these on-site PMs, they will tell you the truth, but most of them recognize a certain level of professionalism that's needed and, you know, can massage words. And I, I had this lady who flat out just threw the owner right under the bus. And I was like, wow, <laughs> like I was completely shocked that she just kind of went off about all the issues. She's like, I've been here for six months. I started here. There's been no help there. And she just went through a whole laundry list of what was going on. And I'm like, well, sure checks the box there. I mean, the, the broker told me that it was uh being mismanaged by the owner. And apparently the on-site manager feels exactly the same way. We would tour units and she was like, you see this here? You see that? And they didn't do that. And and I'm like, okay, well, that, that story completely checks out, right? Uh, so it's always interesting to talk to different people who maybe didn't get the memo of here's the story, here's the company line, and uh, just get it direct. And, and sometimes those people are on site, they're frustrated. And, and, and they may also be fearful that, their job's going to disappear. So it, there's a whole lot of different emotions that that come into play. And, and you know, at your job when you're getting into due, due diligence is to be a little bit of an investigator, right? And understand what's the real story here. And, it, and it's not to try to catch somebody in a lie or anything like that. It's really so you get a clear sense of what are you going to be walking into day one? So you can put together the right business plan to attack this thing and you're not getting surprised. Um, you know, Greg, talk to me a little bit more about kind of your fewer, you know, your future looking outlook, right? As you go into 2024, kind of what's on the horizon for Ashland Capital? I, I would say hope that we can find, you know, things to acquire. So, you know, working diligently to to turn over stones and, you know, acquire more. And when I say hope that we can acquire you know, really that's somewhat driven by market forces, but, you know, going to be working tirelessly to, to identify a, a few more acquisitions for the portfolio across multifamily and, and student. Um, and I, I would say cautiously optimistic that, that we will get, you know, at least a couple done in 24. Has there been any, I guess, notable changes to your criteria uh, or your buy box moving forward that maybe wasn't the case a year ago? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here for um, and add a little bit of a color there. You know, where I think there is um, unrewarded risk is, is an area that I think a lot of, of guys played in and I'm still seeing I'm still seeing a number of people still pursuing the same strategy, which I don't think works today. And that is value add at a older vintage C-class property. I think the days of, um, you know, uh, the days of buying, you know, 70s, 60s vintage assets, putting some lipstick on it, you know, uh, forcing rents, especially in this environment, it, it becomes more challenging. And, and, I, and I don't think that reveals itself until the exit as much. And what I mean by that is we've seen, you know, rate cap compression. We've seen, you know, a, a convergence of cap rates between C and A properties, everything in between. It's just like it all blended together. And now we're seeing the result of that. When you see what, what I know definitively through, through data is that the, the biggest the biggest areas that have been hit, the biggest parts of our, our real estate market are C-class assets. You've seen, you've seen values drop dramatically on C-class and you've seen them frankly drop less on A-class. <clears throat> so 
that has to inform you. That has to inform you and say, okay, number one, we've been beat up with dealing with a rougher asset. It's a lot more work. It's a lot more risk, right? Um, so do we continue doing that? No, of course we don't. And we don't underwrite that we're going to exit at a five cap for a 1970s vintage deal. And I am shocked at how many folks I'm still seeing, you know, saying, well, you know what, five years from now, interest rates are going to be, uh, you know, lower. Okay, they might be, but they may not be, right? If you look at historically over the last 40 years, they may not be if you're taking an average. Um, so I, I think there's, I think that's an area of risk. So that's a long way of saying, um, number one, we're much less interested in a, in an older vintage C-class value add, unless it's a unique situation, unique demographic that we can really get our arms around and have conviction that they're going to pay their rent, that their income is such that we can have a little bit of, of, of rent movement. The market supports it. The demographic supports it. So we're much more scrutinizing in terms of the ability to execute a business plan. And ultimately what that does for us is it forces us to less risky deals. And we're okay doing that. We're okay with you know, having our returns, you know, a point or two or three, whatever it is that's reasonable, you know, reduced, but we're also reducing our risk. And uh, I would much rather have liquidity, knowing that in five years, I'm going to be able to sell this asset. I'm going to be able to sell it at a, at a reasonable, respectable cap rate. I can depend on it. My investors can depend on it versus, you know, I think what John, you and I have seen over the last three, four years, people haven't adjusted their business plan. While they may be able to get a little bit of, uh, of rent bump, they may put some lipstick on that asset. But I don't think they're going to exit at a five cap for a 70s vintage. And I think they're going to have a rude awakening at a six and a half to seven cap exit and say, we did all this work. And especially for the sponsors, here's here's another flaw. Sorry to go off on this tangent a bit, but another flaw from a sponsor. A sponsor doesn't make money until you hit your your preferred returns and your promote, right? So if you're if you're underwriting to a five and you're doing all this work and you spend five years of your life and then all of a sudden you exit five years later at a six, six and a half, seven cap, what happens? You return, you know, 9% IRR to your investors and you as a sponsor made zero. So you set bad expectations for your investor base and then you as a sponsor wasted five years of your life and made zero. I think there's a tremendous amount of, of unsophisticated, uneducated sponsors doing that today, continuing to do that. And they're going to have that rude awakening five years from now. If you are looking at a C-class 1960s vintage property, I, I implore you to play back what Alex just said. Um, there are certainly different circumstances that those deals still make sense. But uh, for the large majority, what you said is spot on. And, and at best, you're speculating that cap rates are going to be lower on the back end. Um, I would definitely make sure that your business plan makes sense, but then also that you have kind of the the funds available to manage, you know, those capex items that pop up from from owning older buildings, right? You can't just paint the units and be good to go. Like you may need to, you know, do a lot of plumbing work or roofing work or whatever the case may be. So, uh, really good insights there. Um, for folks who want to learn more about you all and kind of the deals you have going, they can check out your website. Go to ashlandcapitalfund.com. That's ashlandcapitalfund.com. We'll make sure we link to that in our show notes. But right now, we're going to go to our round of insights. So I'll ask a question. One of you go ahead and decide who wants to answer it, and we'll go from there. All right. First question, give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Um, I think it goes back to uh, what I just talked about for me, that, um, you know, if you get too aggressive on exit caps and assumptions and the world changes, then that sets you up for failure. Consequently, if you take, you know, a couple of bruises along the way, that's going to set you up for long term success where you won't, you won't make those uh, assumptions again. Right. So I think it, it goes back to not speculating when you invest in real estate be an investor rather than a speculator and speculating on where interest rates will go 
Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. Greg, I'm gonna I'm gonna punt to you. I wish I had one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, right take, back. I'll, I'll take it back. I I'll just give you genre rather than book, but I'll tell you that um, I've read a ton of real estate books and just sort of business books. I have shifted, which ties back to to uh, to business, is is really taking care of me. So I'm obsessed with nutrition, with supplements, with with uh, just taking care of you know mind and body so that I can be most effective with my family and business. And I will tell you that I've made a lot of uh, headway in the last uh, few years with that. So, so I consume anything on, on those topics that I see in videos and books. All right, give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Greg? Uh, Greg's fun this say, whole segment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I just went radio silent. Um, I, I, I find, um, uh, CoStar to be very valuable just as a resource overall, just market data and Intel. There's the other platform that you like as well. I remind yeah, me. Reonomy, Reonomy yeah, Reonomy is, yeah. Reonomy is, is a, is a great one, uh, that is, I would say that's that's my um, that's my little cheat tool. You that's Reonomy and CoStar. Yeah. Where where Alex was talking about getting debt intel on deals, that's that's where I snag it from on everything. Awesome. We'll make sure we definitely link to those two. All right, give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. I want to hear this from both of you guys. Uh, I'm old school, so it's a pad of paper. Um, you know, I've got just sort of mapped out long term goals that I, I try to keep an eye on. Uh, and then, you know, weekly goals, uh, a, a notepad that says, hey, here are the two, three most important initiatives. Um, I'm pretty big on not just flooding a, a, a pad of paper with, you know, 25 goals that I'm only going to, you know, uh, accomplish half of. I'm just going to put like critical path. You know, these three initiatives have to be moved forward this week. And that that's that always works for me. Mine, mine is actually a, a little away from work, quite honestly. It's a little bit more uh, mindfulness piece is just morning coffee with with my wife and my son, just having a little bit of time to to let everything kind of be still and and you know have that little serenity before uh, before everything starts going. Um, that that gives me my energy for the day. All right, this one's for Alex. Give me your number one insight for investing in an uncertain market. An uncertain, what do you mean by uncertain? Like a new market? Uncertain future, so uncertain economy, I should say. Oh, in an uncertain economy. Um, you know, I think it, it goes back to really understanding all the local drivers. So from, you know, what side of the tracks do you want to be on? You know who is the who is the demographic? You know, do you, you do you want to be in the A class or do you want to be in a C class? So it's it's just intel, and that informs you. And you can get that intel from any market. And you and I go back to the old uh, 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 cliche that you can make money in any market if you know that market. So that that's really it. Just just know it, understand it, and we could talk for hours on what the tools are to to get that information, but. You know, I think we all we all know what those are. No, good stuff. All right, let's lighten the mood. We've talked a lot about the economy, but uh, you two guys are in two of the biggest cities in the world, or at least in the United States, New York and Chicago. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. All right, go ahead, Greg. Uh, what what you got from New York? Um, 
Oh, gosh. This is tough. This is See, tough. Too, too many choices. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't I don't know that I have a favorite. This is this is very Alex, you go first. Give me a minute. All right, I'll, I'll go first. So I'm into small little, you know, authentic places like I'm not going to cite, you know, the the Michelin star restaurants downtown Chicago. I go for the little dives that that are sort of in our backyard. So uh, we there's a little Thai place we love called Thai Inbox, not too mm -hmm. far from where I live. The best Thai food, I think. Uh, and then, um, you know, we'll go to little little joint sushi places in, in the neighborhood. Uh, in fact, I, when Greg was in town, took him to a, a great little sushi joint. So we're all about small, accessible, easy. I got an eight year old. We're not going downtown to a fancy place and taking, you know, four hours of our lives. Then um, that's the beauty of Chicago. Chicago is full of amazing food you know, located in little, you know, neighborhoods or, or the city at large. I love it. I love it. Greg, what, what do you got there for us? I, I may, I may have to go the sushi route also, actually. There, there is a place in Chappaqua where I live or the Chappaqua area where I live that is fantastic. Not New York City, but called Harame that my family and I love to go to or pick up from pretty much every week, but in the city, you know, there are a bajillion great sushi places um, that I can't even begin to enumerate, which which is the, the all time favorite. But I'm going to give a shout out to to Harame, uh, which is a local favorite because we do that at least once a week. And that is right. that is my go to. I love it, guys. Well, listen, those are two good options, two big cities that I know our listeners are traveling too often. So uh, let's definitely make sure we add those to the list. And I just want to thank both of you guys for coming on the show today. I mean, gave us some great information. I appreciate how you talked a little bit about kind of your backgrounds, but getting into multifamily, getting into student housing, you know, talking about, you know, why these are two kind of recession resilient asset classes and also how you're navigating the landscape kind of moving forward. Uh, I really appreciate the way you talked about, you know, where there's potential risk in the marketplace today, you know, that value add C class deal definitely want to be more cautious if you're investing with that strategy just making sure that you know your your exit cap rate projections are, are more accurate and you build in some flexibility in case you're off on those numbers uh really good insight and i think great forewarning for anyone who is looking to invest in those kind of deals uh, again for anyone who wants to learn more about you all and the deals you're working on they can go to ashlandcapitalfund.com again that's ashlandcapitalfund.com I want to thank you guys again for coming on Multifamily Insights. We look forward to staying in touch with you and hope you have a great day. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, John.